it's Jamie from, oop, here we go. Hey guys, it's Jamie from Not So Wimpy Teacher, and it's time for my weekly live show. I'm pretty excited because I get to talk about one of my very favorite topics, and that's writing. So if you teach writing, this is going to be a good one. I am going to be sharing about how I would help my students to revise their writing. So um, while I get started with like all of the intro stuff, type in the discussion box. Let me know, do your students struggle with writing? Um, do you teach them how to revise? Do they struggle with the revision? Do they spend time on the revision? Let me know where you're at. And I'm just pulling up my notes here so that I remember to tell you all the good stuff. Um, so I've been starting my live shows by sharing a little bit about myself. Um, we've been really enjoying getting to know each other on these shows. So one thing I realized I haven't told you yet, and I can't even believe I haven't told you, but um, I am a band nerd from way back. So I played the flute and the piccolo. I played, I started playing when I was in the fifth grade and I played all the way through my sophomore year of college. The marching band is where I met my husband and some of my very best friends. So I'm a marching band nerd. And my daughter, my oldest daughter is in band now. She plays the flute and she starts marching band um, in like this summer. Well, actually like she starts in May. So I'm really excited to have a kiddo who is a marching band nerd too. I don't know if any of, if any of you, do I have any um, fellow marching band nerds in the not so wimpy teacher community? I hope so, because it's a special kind of um, feeling being a band nerd. <laughs> okay, so um, guys, I talk about writing a lot. If you didn't know that, I do. I talk about writing, I blog about writing, I podcast about writing. It's it's not that like writing was my very favorite subject to teach because it wasn't. In fact, writing was so difficult to teach that I hated it and I was terrible at it. Way to go. I have a lot of fellow band nerds. Yay. Okay. Sorry. But I was terrible at it. And so, um, I had to learn, like I was so bad at it that it forced me to learn and get better. And I just want to share what I learned and what I ended up doing that really work for me because I know that some of you are struggling too because it's just a really tricky subject to teach. And so I share about all of the, the terrible mistakes I made and um, what I did to fix all of this. So today is revising. Every single time I talk about revising, at least one teacher will say, um, Jamie, how do you get your students to revise their writing? Like, Every time I talk about writing, somebody asks that. So um, I don't give them a choice. I know that's not really a very helpful um, response. So I kind of want to go into explaining what I really mean by that. But first of all, can we start with what in the world is revising? And maybe, maybe you already know really well what revising is, but when I started teaching, and I'm, I always, I always tell you all the truth, even if it's embarrassing. But when I started teaching, I thought that revising and editing were the same. I didn't really understand why they were two different steps in the writing process, because the writing process is planning, drafting, revising, editing, publishing. I didn't understand why there was a revising step and an editing step, because I thought that revising and editing were synonyms, that they meant the same thing. And so I didn't understand why in the world we would have two different steps on the writing process that meant the same thing. So I pretty much treated them like they were the same thing. And I realized that they are very different, guys. Revising and editing are not the same at all. So before we even get into my tips for helping your students revise their writing, I want to make sure that we're on the same page about what revising is and what editing is, because today I'm talking about revising. I will talk about editing later um, in another video, but okay, let's start with revising. 
revising. They are the things that we do to make our story or our report sound better. They, the revision process can take days or even weeks to complete. To completely revise a piece, honestly, can take weeks. Revising includes things like making your lead stronger, adding examples to support your reasoning, adding more detailed words, um, writing a stronger thesis statement, um, adding in text features. These are all examples of revision. They'll make your writing sound better. Okay. Editing. Just so that we can know the difference. Editing are the things that we do to make our story look better. Not sound better, look better. Editing in your classroom probably only takes a day or two. Um, although professional editors take longer. In our classroom, our students probably only need a couple of days for editing. And it includes things like fixing mix, uh, misspelled words, correcting punctuation, and capitalizing those proper nouns. Um, I want to point something out here. So like, I hope we understand the difference. Like revising are like all of those skills that we need to do to make our writing sound so much better, to be stronger. Editing is what we do to make it look better. Fix the, the capitalization, the spelling, the grammar. Okay. Um, I want to point something out. This is my rubric inside my writing units. You can find my writing units on my Teachers Pay Teacher store. I currently have um, second and third grade um, full year. I have fifth grade and fourth grade personal narrative. And tomorrow I will be releasing fourth and fifth grade informational at 50% off. So you might want to set a reminder in your phone right now if you teach fourth or fifth grade. <laughs> okay, so this is a rubric out of my writing unit. I want to use it as an example. This rubric, 80% of the items on this rubric are done during the revision stage. Only 20% are done during the editing stage. I gotta say it again. 80% of the things your students are gonna be graded on actually happen during the revision stage not the editing stage. I mean, this one, I'm actually looking at it more. I mean, wow, your kiddos could definitely get a high B, even a low A. If they had terrible spelling, they could still get a B, okay? I wanna point that out because as teachers, and I'm, I totally was guilty of this, and this is why I know we do this. As teachers, we tend to focus on that 20% the most, right? We tend to be like, oh my God, their spelling is horrible. This whole paper is just terrible because they actually misspelled Washington, even though it's a report about Martha Washington, right? We do that. We focus on how it looks because it, it and it's just human nature. I'm going to be real. Honestly, it's just human nature. When someone writes and their handwriting is poor and their spelling is poor, we subconsciously conclude that their writing is also poor and we just focus on what we see. However, when we look at that rubric, almost all of the points that you're going to be giving your students are things that happen during the revision stage. So guys, revising is so important. So important. It's the most important part of the writing process, really. I'm, I'm going to say that. I, I mean, you can quote me on that. Re revision is the most important part of the writing process. Okay, that is where, that's what makes or breaks the writing, is how much effort went into the revision stage. It will make or break your students, right? So guys, we need to be spending a lot more time focused on the revision stage than the editing stage. We need to spend a lot more time focused on their leads, their paragraphs, their transitions, their juicy words, their reasons and examples, then we need to be focused on spelling and grammar and punctuation. And it's gonna be so hard for you. I'm going to talk a lot more about editing in another video, so I don't want to get off on a tangent. I want to give you some, some tips that helped me to get my students revising their writing because it's important. Clearly, they need to revise their writing. All right. Number one thing I did is that I, okay, well, let me tell you what I did wrong to, so you can laugh at me. Um, I was 
tell my kids, this is in the early years of teaching, I was doing writing workshops, so a little pat on the back for me, even though it was going pretty awful. I would gather my kids on the carpet and I'd be like, okay guys, it's time, some of you, because remember they were all writing different um, pieces, they were all at different places in the writing process, it was a mess. We don't do that anymore, but I would say, some of you are ready to revise your work. Now don't forget, I want you to, to think about adding some more transitions and, and maybe some more interesting words. And please make sure you have some good examples. And um, also make sure your topic sentences are good and you've got paragraphs. And okay, go back to your seats and do that. I don't give them like 20 minutes to get it done. I'm like, all right, they're revising, right? I was always disappointed. Most of my kids did nothing. I'm done, they would say a couple minutes later. I'm done. I already revised it. It's good. It's really good. Revisions cannot happen in 20 minutes. Revisions definitely don't happen in just a couple of minutes. Guys, this is a couple of week long process. And it dawned on me that I was giving my kids time to edit and telling them to edit, but I was not teaching them how to edit. I was failing them. I mean, I was expecting them to go through this huge, I mean, I said edit, but I meant revision. Dang it. I was giving them time to revise. I was telling them to revise and yet I hadn't actually taught them the skills that they needed to successfully revise. I gave them this long list of things that I expected them to do and it, I don't know about you, but someone gives me a long list of things they expect me to do. I am in overwhelm stage and I might not do any of them. So that's really what I was doing to my kiddos. They were not revising their work because they didn't even know where to start or how to start it. And they just assumed, eh, it's good enough. So it took me a while to realize this, guys. I'm not lying. It took me a while. Yes, it is incredibly realistic to expect second graders to revise. Everyone needs to do revision. It's in the writing process. And I've had teachers go, well, my students can't revise. Well, I didn't like make up the writing process. So uh, I can't take credit for that. But if I could make the whole writing process, like revision would still be there. Um, yes, every student should be expected to revise. We don't even, starting in um, the very young grades, we need to teach them that they have to revise. Will their pieces look the same finished product as a fifth grader? No, but we never want to just sort of teach part of the process because then it's going to get harder every year for the next teacher to teach like, oh, no, 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 hon, you're not done in one day. It gets harder. So we have to expect them to go through the process. And I think second grade and up absolutely should be doing this. So I'm going to kind of explain to you what I ended up doing to teach the revision steps. And I know that some of you are already doing this. So if you're using my writing units, then this is going to sound really familiar. I don't tell my kids how many sentences they need to write in their writing. Like to me, telling your kids how long the writing has to be is, is pointless. It needs to be quality. It's all about quality, not quantity. So if they've done everything they need to do to tell the story, then it's long enough. I, I don't care how long it is. In fact, I hate when kids write chapter books because it's usually just fluff, 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 fluff. And it's really hard for them to edit and revise it. I'd rather a really well-written short piece than a long piece of fluff any day. But not everyone agrees with me on that. Okay, so I realized that I was spending, I realized that I need to spend more time on revision, right? So I, in fact, if it's 80% of my rubric, it should be at least 80% of my mini lessons. At least 80% of my mini lessons should be on a revision strategy. Not editing, not like what is a plural noun, and um, not on brainstorming and using graphic organizers. Those things are great. They need to know that, but that is not how I need to spend the majority of my time. And so what I started to do is that I would teach one small revision lesson in each mini lesson day, every day, one small revision lesson. We would first plan and draft. Planning was about three days, drafting about two days, then a couple of weeks of revision, where every day's mini lesson is a new skill that they need to revise their writing. So I might start off at the beginning and say, okay, today we're going to learn about writing great leads. I'm going to read them a mentor text passage or a mentor text book if you prefer. 
picture book that has a good um, lead, a passage that has a good lead. In my writing units, they already come with them. So I would read it, we'd discuss the lead and what it was like and why we liked it. We would fill out an anchor chart with different types of leads. Again, those anchor charts are in my, in my units, but um, then we would talk about different types of leads and then I'd send them back to their seat. Today's task, it is not to revise all of their draft. Nope, today's task is to write out four different leads and circle the one that you think is the strongest, right? So now then they can go back to their draft and, and input this lead into their draft. They're revising their lead today and that is it. I don't expect them to work on their conclusion or their dialogue, their paragraphs, their topic sentences, nothing. Only the lead. I'm not giving them a huge list of things like all of these things must be done, writers, because that's it's overwhelming. When we get a big list, we do nothing. I give them one small task. And that is why a second grader can do it because we are taking it from something that's big and hard and confusing and we are making it into simple, tiny, manageable tasks that they can do one task each day until their whole paper is revised. Okay, so um, one, my writing units have the lesson plans all done, so you don't even have to come up with those. Um, my husband's got, he just left a link to it, and I will update the description of this video with a link as well. They're on Teachers Pay Teachers. Um, even if you're not going to use my writing units, I have this free guide. Yeah, it's free. This free guide of what you need to teach. Okay, so um, it goes through, like, if you're teaching a personal narrative, you need to teach the following lessons, okay? And underneath them, it has little bullet points that gives you some suggestions for teaching that lesson, okay? And then it goes through informational, does the same thing, um, opinion, all the different lessons, and fiction, all the different lessons. So it's a handy guide, and it's totally free. We'll drop a link to that, too. But I will, um, I will update the video description with these links. The links work better after the video is over anyway. Okay? And I don't want you to go anywhere because I'm not done yet. I have so many more things to tell you about revising. But I feel like I needed to start right there. That The number one thing I did that changed everything for my students was I started teaching tiny snippets each day. And then having them go back and revise that tiny part of their draft daily. Instead of giving them a huge list of things that good writers do when they revise, I took it one small step at a time and it made a huge difference, okay? So definitely if you're not using my writing units, grab the free guide. If you are using writing units and you have the lesson plans already, so you have the guide like 2.0 version. All right. Um, so I'm going to kind of answer some questions I always get before you even get a chance to ask them. This is one I get, okay? I get this question often when I talk about revising. Um, should I have my students rewrite their masterpiece story every time they make revisions? No, 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 no. Guys, if you make your students rewrite their story multiple times, this might happen. Your students will start to hate revising. And so, therefore, they will not want to revise next time you ask them to. They'll hate revising. Um, they may even go as far as to hate writing because you've made them recopy their story so many times. And I hate to say it, but it might be true. They might even start hating you. Um, no, 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 no. It is a serious waste of time anyway. During their independent writing time, you want them to continuously be producing new work revising or editing the work they currently have. You don't want them just recopying. Like that's not a good use of their time unless your whole goal is to teach them like handwriting. Um, otherwise, it's really just not a good use of their time. So I'm gonna tell you something and it's gonna be harder for some of you than others. It's really hard for me. I'm pretty OCD. I like things to be just so. I like neatness. Um, their draft is gonna get messy. Yep, it's gonna get real messy, guys. Like, there will be arrows, there will be asterisks, little stars um, all over the paper. In fact, there may even be a whole paragraph that they've completely X'd out. And if you're like me, like, that's gonna be pretty hard for you to look at. This is normal. It's normal. Your, their draft, if they have been revising it every day, doing a little more revision to their draft, 
it's going to be messy. That's just normal. And yes, I also get this, well, won't my students get confused? Won't this be so hard for my students? My students can never handle that. First of all, never assume your students can't handle something without um, giving them the opportunity and teaching them how to handle it. Um, yes, it is going to be hard for some of your students. Other students, it's like no big deal. But for some of your students, the mess of their draft will be really challenging for them. Okay, it will be. Um, but you are going to teach them how to organize these revisions. You're going to give them strategies. And guess what? It will get easier every time they do it. So that first piece, it may be like kind of really hard for them. And the second piece, maybe still hard. By the third piece, maybe they're starting to get somewhere. But guys, you are just one stop on their trip. You are maybe their second grade teacher or their third grade or their fourth grade teacher. They have a lot of stops left to go on this educational trip. So it's important that we continue to teach them that is important to revise. We can't just not do it because it's messy. Because guess what? When they get to high school and college and they don't revise their writing and they just turn in their first draft, like that's kind of on us if we did not ex like make them see how important it was early on, okay? Now, someone just asked, well, how do you tell them that their first draft isn't good enough? Guys, they don't have a choice in my class. Like I said, with those mini lessons, they just don't have a choice. Every day I am going to do something with them and they're gonna have a small task to do. Like. I'm um, gonna be honest, most of my kids don't even realize we're revising. Like they don't even notice it because it's just, that's what today we learned about leads. Um, today we learned about dialogue. I added some dialogue. Um, they don't even realize it until the end when they look at their paper and they're like, whoa, it's, it's a lot different than when I first started. Okay. Um, remind your students too that professional writers write a draft and then they go through major revision and editing processes and that their draft gets messy too. Professional writers have messy drafts. Okay, they have arrows, they have X's, they have notes in the margins. It's normal. It will be hard at first, but the best way to get past something that's hard is to continue to practice. Okay, it does get easier. I've watched it get easier. Others of your students really won't have a challenge with this, but you will have some. Everybody does. So one thing that I found that helps my students, uh, all my students, but especially those students who are going to struggle a little bit with the mess of revision is teaching them how to best set up their paper so that they have room to make revisions. Um, before your students draft, you want them to set up their paper in such a way that they will be saving space for those revisions because you know they're gonna be making revisions, okay? So there's three different things I have my students do and they all work, um, they all just give them a little extra space for revisions later. Some of my students use them differently, it's okay. I'm gonna kind of show you. So this would be one, an example of one of my students' notebooks. And so their masterpiece writing, their draft would be right here. This is how I'm gonna have them set up their writing. First of all, they must skip lines. I go ahead and have them mark X's here in the margin to remind them to skip lines. For most students, that's enough to remind them. You know, I'm still gonna have some students where you're walking by while they're drafting, you're like, skip lines, skip lines. Um, they get better at this. Um, the reason you want them to skip lines is that they're probably going to need to, like there's gonna be spots in the writing where they're just gonna add a word or two here or there, fix the spelling. And having that extra space above or below the words will give them room to make those revisions and even edits, okay? So you want them to skip lines anytime they're drafting. It's really important. Okay, the second thing I have them do is I have them draw this line this um, vertical line all the way down like the last like third of the paper, giving like the margin of the paper is right here. Oops, right here. So it's even further than the margin. I have them do this. I tell them do not write on this side of the line. It's gonna leave this whole column empty. They're only writing from here to the line, from the X to the line, okay? Um, this is good because there's going to be spots when they're revising where they want to add an extra sentence and it doesn't always fit in those skipped lines. So they can draw an arrow over here to this column to put in an extra sentence, okay? And this just gives them a little more space. Now you're looking at this and you're going, wow, there's not very much room on each page to write. There's not, and that's okay because we want them to save room for the revisions they're going to make later, okay? They're going to be adding a lot during the revision stage. That's what's going to make their writing so exciting. The other thing that I do, the third thing, is I, I have my students not write on the back of their paper, okay? My students do not write on the backs of their papers either when they're drafting, and it's not because I wanna kill all the trees, but 
when they're revising, they may be adding an additional paragraph. They might go, wow, when I was writing my opinion, I definitely did not consider the opposing opinion. I'm gonna write an entire new paragraph with another reason. And so, in the middle of their draft, they can make a little asterisk, which is just a star symbol. It's, if you tell them it's it, like a little star symbol, it honestly doesn't matter if they make a, they make a, I don't know, triangle, it doesn't matter. Making a symbol there to tell them to flip to the back of the page because that's where the par the new paragraph will go. All right? This gives them lots of room when they need to add something big. And guess what? All your writers at some point are going to be like, whoa, I need to add something big. They might cross off a whole paragraph and be like, hey, now that I know more, I actually want to change how that paragraph works altogether. And so they can use the back of their paper for that. So yeah, as you can see, it's going to get messy. It just is. If you already know ahead of time it's going to get messy and you even warn your kiddos, it's going to get a little messy. I'm not saying you have permission to write in your sloppy handwriting, but it's going to get a little messy. That's all right. I understand it's going to get messy. You understand. Um, after you taught them how to set up their paper, they've written their draft, and you're getting ready to start revisions, you might want to take some time to teach them strategies for adding text to the work. My, I mean, my simple examples, these are the ones I like to teach my kids. I teach them little carrot symbol, little carrot, little pointer, because when they're just adding an extra couple of words, they can use the carrot symbol to show where they would go and write it in that, um, empty, that empty space right above the line. I also teach them arrows. Guys, nothing wrong with, okay, I'm going to want to add another sentence here, draw an arrow all over to that blank column on the side of the paper where they can now write that sentence. When they get to the publishing stage, because they're not going to read copy over and over, when they get to the publishing stage, they'll see that arrow and they'll know to go over to that column and grab that extra couple of sentences they wrote. And the other one I teach them is that asterisk. And I honestly don't care. It's a symbol. Have them draw a symbol. If there's a symbol that works better for them, I don't know, go for it. If, if you want to have them write a diamond or a triangle, whatever you want them to draw. But that would mean that when they get to that symbol, when they're um, publishing and they get to that symbol, they'll know, oh, there's something I need to add here. And then I can flip the page and find what they're adding there. I taught my kids these three strategies and you'll have to reteach them throughout the year and you're gonna have to keep practicing them. And certain kids are gonna need more support, but you'll give it to them during the writing conferences. But they get better and better all year with these strategies. And they come up with their own too. They come up with their own symbols and things, that's fine. It's fine. It's their work as long as it means something to them and it helps them to revise their writing. Uh, another thing you can do to help to make the revision stand out, not get missed, is you could provide colored pens or pencils. Maybe there's a certain color that they use during the revision process, which will be most of the writing process. Remember, um, it's like three days of planning, two days of drafting, weeks of revision, two days of editing, two days of publishing. Um, so, but you could give them a different color pen or pencil that they can use so that the arrow or the asterisk stands out more. That way they don't miss it later when they're publishing. It's usually about this time that a teacher says to me something like, um, this is all fine and dandy, but I, I'm one to one and I just have my kids type everything they write. So we don't have to worry about any of this. Okay, first of all, it's really cool that so many classrooms have so much technology. When it's used right, technology is amazing and our kiddos should be using it and learning how to use it because it's going to be an important part of their career no matter what career they go into. Some states have even made it a standard to type student writing. That the, My state, it's a standard that they must type their writing, okay? Um, I just want to say this, it's really important. Resist the urge to have students start typing too soon. I didn't say don't let your students type. I said resist the urge to let your students type too soon. Always have students start by drafting on paper. They're far more creative. If they're not worrying about typos and misspelled words and grammar and like, why are there red squigglies? Why are there green squigglies? Um, they're gonna be more creative. They don't have to worry about formatting. When it, a student is drafting, they should be encouraged. It's like a brain dump. Just let it all out. Everything that you're thinking, get it, get it out on paper. We're gonna revise the heck out of it. We're gonna edit the heck out of it. I don't want you thinking about any of that right now. And when they have paper, then there's no red squigglies, there's no formatting issues, none of that. 
And this helps them to be so much more creative and get the story out without forgetting it. Like, I don't know about you, but sometimes when I'm typing, I'm like, what was I, was I typing? When they're writing, they're going to get it out faster because they're actually usually, they're usually better at writing than typing at this age. But now they also just aren't distracted by the computer telling them that they're wrong. Okay. Makes them more creative. But after the story is drafted, if you're one-to-one -one or you have a lot of technology in your classroom, it's a great idea. As soon as the draft's done, have them type it. Sure, because that's going to make revising a lot easier. They don't, the, the student who has the technology isn't going to have to do arrows and asterisks and things. I think it's a cool skill to learn, but ultimately in their world, technology is going to be a huge part of it. So it's great. They type up their work. They can then obviously just click back in and add and change things really, really easily. But wait until after they draft and then they could type it and then you could do revisions. Obviously, that's not a solution for all teachers because not every teacher is one-to-one -one or has enough technology for students to access their writing every single day. So for those of us who don't are not one-to-one, -one, we are going to have to teach our students how to use their pen and pencil to um, go in and revise. Okay, I've seen a couple of questions and I'm going to try to answer them, but it's um, but feel free if you have a question about revising writing to go ahead and stick it in there and I'll do my best to answer it how I would answer it. Um, first of all, somebody asked, like, do your kiddos write in pen or pencil when they're drafting? I had to say when I first started teaching writing, I thought it was absurd to allow them to use anything but a pencil. <laughs> I mean, it just seemed wrong to me, like students use pencils. That's just the way it goes. I have grown in my thinking a lot. And um, many years, I allowed my students to choose their writing utensils. And that meant some chose the standard number two pencil. Some chose a mechanical pencil. Others chose pens. Some like just a ballpoint pen, like a Bic. And some liked a gel pen. And you know what? I'll let them pick because it makes writing more engaging for them, more fun for them. And ultimately, if they're engaged and enjoying the writing process, you're going to get better work out of them. So they're going to be revising and editing the heck out of this thing. So it doesn't matter if it's in pencil or pen for the most part. Um, somebody else asked, do they print? Do they do cursive? Uh, I think that's going to be different state to state as far as standards and so forth uh, and grade to grade. My third graders were just learning cursive. And so I asked them not to use cursive in their drafts because we were learning like a letter a week. And so they didn't even know the whole alphabet, capital and lowercase. Um, so they really couldn't do it. I don't think it's good to practice something wrong. So my kids printed their writing. It, they were faster at it anyway. But I would, towards the end of the year, have kiddos who, when they were publishing it, when, when if we did do a form of publishing that involved handwriting it, I would have kiddos who would try to do it in cursive then. And it was kind of exciting when they tried to do it then because we had learned all of the cursive letters by then. But that's going to be different and totally a personal choice for you, depending on your state and your grade level. Okay. I did get some questions about where my writing units are sold. They're sold in my teacher's paid teacher store, which is not so a teacher. Um, and I've left a link for it and I will be updating the video description with the link for them. Again, I have full year bundles for second grade and third grade, fourth grade, and fifth grade currently have personal narrative available. And tomorrow I am going to be dropping informational for fourth and fifth grade into my store at 50% off. Um, it will only be 50% off for a short while. So you might want to make yourself a note in your phone on your calendar to check those out. I'm going to put them up in the morning. So um, if you're a fourth or fifth grade teacher, it's a great way to try out one of my writing units at a hugely discounted price. I am impressed, Stacey, that you allow your students to use your flares. I love flare pens too. They're my very favorite writing utensil and I choose to write in purple flare almost all the time. I don't even know why I buy packages of colors because I just use the purple all the time. <laughs> uh, but it would be hard for me to share my flares with my kids, but yes, they do. They love to use pens and feel more grown up. And if you want them to write like they're more grown up, make them feel like they're more grown up. So that's just my thought on that too. If you guys have more questions about um, revising writing or about um, the writing units, the free writing guide, go ahead and type them into the comments. I'll come back later in the evening and try and give some answers if I've missed some questions. So um, biggest thing though, if you want your kids to revise their writing, you teach them a tiny little snippet every day about revising their writing. So yeah, guys, 
it's going to take him a while to finish a piece, like really finish a piece. But how I see it is you can have him write a whole new piece every week and you can end up with like 30 some pieces that are kind of fluff or you can really teach them how to revise, take a long time finishing a unit and end up with maybe only eight to 10 published pieces that are phenomenal. And I would rather have phenomenal than just a whole bunch of pieces that don't show the skills that I know my students are capable of if I take the time to teach them. My students don't even know they're revising. All they know is today we worked on leads because I don't send them back to their seats and say, it's time to revise. Instead, I teach them about great leads and then I ask them to back to their seat and brainstorm four leads um, using the four types of leads we learned today. Tomorrow, it'll be different. Tomorrow, I'm gonna teach them about paragraphs or topic sentences or transition words or conclusions. And then I'll send them back with another small task. At the very end, they're gonna have an amazing piece to publish and they are not even gonna realize that they were doing so much revision until I tell them. <laughs> All right, guys, I want you to have a not so wimpy night. Um, I should mention, if you guys listen to my podcast, I've decided to do a little teacher appreciation bonus. And this week and next week, there's going to be a new podcast every single morning, every single morning. So I started this morning and tomorrow I've got another amazing podcast ready for you. I wanted to tell you I appreciate you by giving you as many tips as I could come up with for um, this week. We're talking about the end of the year. So head over to the Not So Wimpy Teacher podcast if you're a podcast listener. All right, guys, have a not-so-wimpy night. I will chat with you soon.